Yes, yes, yes. Hello, this is your buddy Carl for a daily Bible reading. And it is, well, <laughs> this is the reading for July 31st. And later today, I will try to get August 1st in so we catch up. Thank you for your patience. This is just the way life goes sometimes. Normally, if I was reading on my own, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just miss a day and just keep my calendar going. And that's why I said throughout these readings, like sometimes it could take you a year and a half, two years, and you can't get discouraged, or you shouldn't. Don't be discouraged because some people just quit. And it's just like, ah, you know, it's kind of like a diet. You fall off the wagon, the next day you're back on, you know. So you keep doing things. Discipline is a powerful thing. So don't let discouragement kind of make you feel like, I just can't do this. You can do this. I can do this. <laughs> things happen. I'm doing other work. I have jobs, multiple things happening, teaching, the church, production stuff, etc., like many of you. And whatever it is, life can happen. So you carve out time as you can. So let's do the daily reading. I will do July 31st here. It's this morning. Saturday morning, August 1st. I'll do July 31st this morning, this evening. Later today, I will post August 1st and we'll be caught up. So, bada bing, bada boom. Here you go, August 31st. The reading was chapter 29 of 2 Chronicles. Remember, Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Chronicles are that, Chronicles. It's almost legal documents, the news, filling in gaps from previous stories, or at least emphasizing what we kind of already know in the history of God's people. Let's pick it up here at 2 Chronicles 29. Hezekiah was 25 years old when he became king of Judah, and he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. Okay, another king now that's going to please the Lord. Let's see what happens. In the first month of the first year of his reign, Hezekiah reopened the doors of the temple of the Lord and repaired them. He summoned the priests and Levites to meet him at the courtyard east of the temple. He said to them, Listen to me, you Levites. Purify yourselves and purify the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all the defiled things from the sanctuary. Our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They abandoned the Lord in his dwelling place. They turned their backs on him. Imagine that, to be a person of faith and your ancestors turn their backs on the Lord, which happens all the time. But you decide to follow the Lord. You decide. Free will. You can choose. You think, my family didn't do this. Or, I don't know, my family doesn't think like this. Doesn't matter. You know, if you look at the evidence for Jesus in the history of Yahweh, the father of uh, you know, God the Father, right? <laughs> All of that. You get to decide. Decide. In our country, it may not be that big of a deal, depending on your culture, depending on, uh, you know, what your family thinks. You know, I come from a Christian family. It's very strong in faith. Yet, we don't all agree on every little thing of scripture or doctrines, and yet we all follow Jesus, right? But think about if you were from something totally different. Atheists that have kids that convert, oh, they can't stand that. Or other religions in other countries. I've known people from traveling around the world. They start to follow Jesus. They, are, they lose their family. They lose their family name. It can be culturally devastating to do that. Think of that. They come to the Lord and then they're willing to risk everything, even their very lives. They have to be, some people can't talk about it, you know. So there you go. Let's pray for people everywhere coming to faith. But sometimes when we think it's the easiest, that can be a hard thing too because we just want to go with the flow. All right, there you go. So I won't preach a sermon. Be encouraged. So here's basically a king now choosing the Lord. He chooses it, right? So he said to them, Listen to me, your Levites. Purify yourselves and purify the temple of the Lord, the God of your ancestors. Remove all the defiled things from the sanctuary. Our ancestors were unfaithful and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. They abandoned the Lord in his dwelling. They turned their backs on him. They also shut the doors to the temple's entry room and they snuffed out the lamps. They stopped burning incense and presenting burnt offerings in the, at the sanctuary of God of Israel. That is why the Lord's anger has fallen upon Judah and Jerusalem. He has made them an object of dread, horror, and ridicule, as you can see with your own eyes. Because of this, our fathers have been killed in battle. 
and our sons and daughters and wives have been captured. But now I will make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, so that his fierce anger will turn away from us. My sons, do not neglect your duties any longer. The Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him, and to lead the people in worship and present offerings to him. Then these Levites got right to work. From the clan of Kohath, Mahath, son of Amase, and Joel, son of Azariah. From the clan of Marari, Kish, son of Abdi, and Azariah, son of Jahalalel. From the clan of Gershon, Joah, son of Zima, and Eden, son of Joah. From the family of Elisaphan, Shimri, and Jael. From the family of Asaph, Zechariah, and Mataniah. From the family of Heman, Jael and Shimei, or Shimei, Shimei, from the family of Judithun, Shem, Shemaiah, and Uziel. These men called together their fellow Levites, and they all purified themselves. In other words, they did all the priest, priestly rituals to be ready to serve the Lord. Right? Then they began to cleanse them, the temple of the Lord, just as the king had commanded. They were careful to follow all the Lord's instructions in their work. The priest went into the sanctuary of the temple of the Lord to cleanse it, and they took out to the temple courtyard all the defiled things they found. From there, the Levites carted it out all to the Kidron Valley. It was kind of like their dump. You'll hear this term about the Kidron Valley, right? They began to work early in spring on the first day of the new year. And in, the, and in eight days, they had reached the entry room of the Lord's temple. Eight days of junk throughout the whole temple. Can you imagine that? Amazing how much pagan activity. They're cleaning the whole temple area. Wow. Wow. Then they purified the temple of the Lord itself, which took another eight days. So the entire task was completed in 16 days. So the rituals of... Sorry, it's getting dark here. Clouds are coming in through Goodlettsville, so... Eight days to just take out the garbage, basically, and then eight days to scrub it down. Let's kind of think of that, folks. All this tribe of Levites going through the whole temple, cleansing it from its, you know, bad history with the pagan worshipers. Wow. Okay, so there you go. Uh, 16 days in all. Verse 18, Then the Levites went to King Hezekiah and gave him this report. We have cleansed the, the entire temple of the Lord, the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the table of the bread of the presence with all its utensils. We have also recovered all the items discarded by King Ahaz when he was unfaithful and closed the temple. They are now in front of the altar of the Lord, purified and ready for use. Early the next morning, King Hezekiah gathered the city officials and went to the temple of the Lord. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, and seven male lambs as a burnt offering, together with seven male goats as a sin offering for the kingdom, for the temple, and for Judah. The king commanded the priests who were descendants of Aaron to sacrifice the animals on the altar of the Lord. So they killed the bulls, and the priest took the blood and sprinkled it on the altar, Next, they killed the rams and sprinkled their bloods on, blood on the altar, and they finally did the same with the male lambs, all of them. The male goats for sin offerings were then brought before the king and the assembly of people who laid their hands on them. The priests then killed the goats as a sin offering and sprinkled their blood on the altar to make atonement for the sins of all Israel. The king had specifically commanded that this burnt offering and sin offering should be made for all Israel. King Hezekiah then stationed the Levites at the temple of the Lord with cymbals, lyres, and harps. He obeyed all the commands that the Lord had given to King David through Gad. The king's seer and the prophet Nathan. Hmm. How about that? So let me read that right. He obeyed all the commands that the Lord had given to King David through Gad, the king's seer, and the prophet Nathan. The Levites then took their positions around the temple with the instruments of David, and the priests took their positions with trumpets. Now imagine this. I'm going to pause here. King David, man after God's heart. This King David is Jesus' lineage. Even with his weird history, and sometimes he just, you know, sinned and forgot the Lord, always came back. He was a shepherd boy. He was a warrior, right? He became king. He was a worshiper, a musician, a, 
a writer, look at all the psalms written by King David, an inventor of musical instruments. How about that? King David, what an amazing man. There you go. So God still uses imperfect people. Praise the Lord. Verse 27. Then Hezekiah ordered that the burnt offering be placed on the altar. As the burnt offering was presented, songs of praise to the Lord were begun, accompanied by the trumpets and other instruments of David, the former king of Israel. The entire assembly worshipped the Lord as the singers sang and the trumpets blew until all the burnt offerings were finished. Imagine that. So a worship service while offerings are being made, singing and sounds and music while they're offering all of this sacrifice to the Lord. I can't imagine that picture. Then the king and everyone with him bowed down in worship. King Hezekiah and the officials ordered the Levites to praise the Lord with the Psalms written by David and by Asaph the seer. So they offered joyous praise and bowed down in worship. Praise, joyous praise and bowing in worship. That's why we get that picture, praise and worship. So praise is this, Leanne and I have spent our whole lives involved in that music, right? Many of you have worship at your church, music and worship, praise and worship, which is, it all kind of blends together now. But really the idea is like singing and shouting and dancing and using musical instruments and making the sound of the Lord. Bowing low is a position of humility and worship. It's just like nothing is above, God is above everything. So this bowing thing is humbling yourself to the lowest place. Now, sometimes we can do it physically, but more importantly, it's a position of our heart, our intention. You know, you could pretend to love God and not know God, right? But it's the bowing of our being, of our spirit, spirit man, right, to God himself. There you go. And they're doing that right now as they're rededicating the temple after cleaning it up. Amazing. Verse 31, Then Hezekiah declared, Now that you have consecrated yourselves to the Lord, bring your sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings to the temple of the Lord. So the people brought their sacrifices and thanksgiving offerings, and all whose hearts were willing brought burnt offerings too. That phrase is important. All whose hearts are were willing, right? You can't force people to worship God. The people brought to the Lord 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 male lambs for burnt offerings. They also brought 600 cattle and 3,000 sheep and goats as sacred offerings. But there were too few priests to prepare all the burnt offerings, so their relatives, the Levites, helped them until the work was finished. And more priests had been purified, for the Levites had been more conscientious about purifying themselves than the priests that had been or the tribe itself, than even the priest is what it's saying. There was an abundance of burnt offerings along with the usual liquid offerings and a great deal of fat from the many peace offerings. So the temple of the Lord was restored to service, and Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced because of what God had done for the people, for everything had been accomplished so quickly. Well, praise the Lord. So the temple is restored. And for July 31st, that's it. Second Chronicles. 29. All right, let's move on for July 31st. The last day of July's reading is Psalm 24, verses 1 through 10, and that's the whole psalm. The theme here is everything belongs to God. <laughs> the glorious eternal King, let us worship him and welcome his glorious reign. Scriptures say the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. He allows us to be here. He, he gave us the earth to be stewards of it, right? So we should be good tenants of God's creation. Yeah, it's not a politics thing. It's about an honoring thing in the fear of the Lord. All right, King David. Hey, thank you, King David. Another psalm of King David, the poet, the writer, the songwriter, king, shepherd, warrior. Imagine all that. Just amazing, man. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. <laughs> yeah. So I was thinking of that, and I didn't know I was quoting Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all its people belong to him. For he laid the earth's foundation on the seas, and he built it on the ocean depths. Who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands and hearts are pure and who do not worship idols and never tell lies. Wow, folks. There you go. So that's what we're called to, to stand in the presence of the Lord. But realize, we have to realize when reading Old Covenant, 
you know, we're not looking for an out, but the one that makes us able to stand in the presence of God is Jesus Christ. Yeah, we don't have to go through the old rituals and sacrifice all these animals and have a priest go into the Holy of Holies. We don't do that anymore because Jesus fulfilled that. He was the perfect Lamb of God, the perfect blood sacrifice. So if you are in Christ and you have faith in that work, you stand under the blood that was poured out from Christ. That's how it works. So you're only holy and able to stand before the Lord in his righteousness because he cloaks you. Think of it as like if you're ordained as royalty, adopted as royalty, it's not because, you know, you're good or that's something about you. The Lord loves you and you've just received what's been available. Now, that causes us to live in righteousness. It should, you know, but that's the goal. So we've talked about that, but I'm just emphasizing that. So here you go. Verse 5, they will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. Open up ancient doors, open up ancient gates, and let the King of glory enter. Who is the King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord invincible in battle. Open up ancient gates, open up ancient doors. Some scriptures read, swing wide ye ancient doors, swing wide ancient gates, that the king of glory may enter in. All right, and that's verse 9. So who is the king of glory? The Lord of heaven's armies. He is the king of glory. Amen and amen. Man, powerful psalm. Psalm 23, right, is a classic as well as you're hitting a stride of a classic psalms here, folks. All right. July 31st, the proverb today is Proverbs 20, verse 12. Ears to hear and eyes to see, both are gifts from the Lord. Ears to hear, eyes to see. It's deeper. It's not just natural hearing and seeing. It's perception and discernment and an open heart to the things of God. Do you have an ear to hear the voice of God, to heed the word, to heed things of the Spirit? And do you perceive it when you're seeing things happening? Do you see beyond just what seems face value? Discernment. Think of that. I wrote discernment alongside that proverb. Yes, Lord, give us your discernment. Yes. Okay. And July 31st, Romans 14 today. Yes, folks, all of 14. So here we go. So remember, we're Paul's laying out the life of faith through the book of Romans. Powerful, powerful. It says, remember previously there in 13, verse 14, instead clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge in evil desire. On to chapter 14, accept other believers, in other words, accept them who are weak in faith and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. How about that? Huh. Don't get into arguments. Everybody's on a different faith journey of maturity. Doesn't mean we can't challenge each other, but don't argue about it. Like, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? That's not good. This is the way to go. Let's live in that. But not like, you're bad, you know. It's just like, you can't do that. <laughs> Yelling and screaming over the gospel is not what we should do. Although even the disciples had disagreements. But anyway, we're not supposed to argue and fight. Uh, verse 2, for instance, one per person believes it's all right to eat anything. Another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. Who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. In the same way, some think one day is more holy than another while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever you do, you choose is acceptable. Those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kind of food do so to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. Those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. Folks, this is heavy stuff. Because there's still a lot of churches, and even within the church, believers like, no, you got to worship God on Saturday, the actual Sabbath, you know, sundown Friday to sundown. No, we got to, you know, commandment says 
you know, of, uh, make the Sabbath day holy. Other people feel like, well, every day is the Lord's because Jesus is my Sabbath rest. Or many in church now, we worship on Resurrection Sunday. How about that? Paul is here saying, don't, don't worry about that. And people say, really? No. And I'm like, well, if you, if you feel compelled and you want to be a Sabbath honoring the actual day, good. If that's the Lord's calling, don't judge people that don't and vice versa. So these, these stuffs, these things should not be contention between believers, but it can be. Even people that eat certain things, you know, gosh, my messianic friends who are Jewish people in Jesus, man, they don't want pork. They don't want, they follow the law of about food and very serious about it sometimes. And they feel like you should too sometimes. I'm like, well, you know, when I'm with them, I do what they do. Not out of fear, but to honor them and not to cause argument. But in my heart, I know God doesn't, it doesn't make a difference to the Lord. All right, moving on. Something to ponder, because here's Paul laying out this stuff, right? For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. And if we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. Christ died and rose again for this very purpose, to be Lord both of the living and the dead. So why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God, for the scriptures say, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend to me, and every tongue will confess and give praise to God. Also, there's other scriptures that say every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? That's very important to remember. I'm not sure which verse that's from, but there you go. Verse 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God, so let's stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. That's key. Do we live to love people and think of others more highly than ourselves? What helps people in their journey? You know what? We don't need to fight over that stuff. I don't. We don't fight over it. And I don't make a case for it. There's no need to have a battleground. You know, some people are like, oh no, you shouldn't have that. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Christians shouldn't have alcohol, right? I'm like, okay, you know, don't, you know. Yes, don't ever be drunk. The scriptures are clear. Don't be drunk with wine or strong drink, right? Any of that. As much as we're not supposed to be gluttons either. But some people are really convicted. Christians should not drink. I'm like, okay. I just won't fight about it anymore. I'm like, in my heart, I know it doesn't matter to the Lord. But for them, it's very serious. And in that case, rather than fight, say, well, I'm just going to sit here and have a drink in front of you to irritate you. Well, that's not loving. <laughs> we don't do that. All right, moving on. You get my point. So we do things out of loving people. Sometimes we just are considerate and honor them and let it go. Um, if they ask why, then we can talk about it, but I won't fight over it. It's not a matter of salvation. It's not a matter of if you're saved, you're saved. If you're in Christ, if you have faith, if you believe in Jesus, he's in your heart, that's it. We're still learning everything else on this earthly journey. And I trust the Holy Spirit to teach each person as we go. Should we speak truth? Yes, but fight? Never. All right. So, but we don't do things to make people stumble and fall. That's what that scripture is saying. So if somebody struggles with it, or if they don't eat pork, right? If I have friends that don't want, I'm not going to have bacon, you know, BLTs when I've got friends that don't eat pork. I wouldn't do it to make the case. I'll have fish. <laughs> yeah, that kind of little stuff makes a difference. Okay, there you go. Verse 14. I know and I'm convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it's wrong, then for that person it's wrong. There you go. Paul says it. And if another believer is distressed by what you eat, wow, you are not acting in love if you eat it. See, don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ had died. Then you will not be criticized for doing something you believe is good. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink, but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whew. Right there, people. Five-star statement. That's what your faith should produce. Goodness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. 
If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God, and others will approve of you too. So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and try to build each other up. Yes and amen. I hope you're built up today. Have a great day. We are going to catch up this evening. The August 1st reading will post, so catch up here or as you can. Again, no condemnation, no guilt. Stay engaged. Keep eating spiritual veggies and grow in the Lord. Grow in your faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day. Bye-bye.